confident that that is is the level that we'd be looking at. Um, but we, you know, we, we can't be absolutely certain. So what we are aiming to do to give councillors uh, more uh, assurance is every year we will be bringing back the, the business plan. We will refresh the business plan every 12 months. Um, decisions on investment um, will be you know, transparent. We will only invest in properties uh, where there is a net positive uh, return uh, from those units. Um, we won't, some local authorities, housing associations, uh, will invest in, in properties that have negative returns just because you know, the stock numbers makes it sit, makes sense to them. Um, but because we are new, uh, we can't afford that. We can't carry uh, negative properties to the rest of the stock. Uh, we don't have a, a sufficient size to do that. So we will be bringing uh, all decisions um, to Cabinet um, for, for approval. And as I say, every year we'll be bringing that business case back, the business plan back, which will be refreshed with all of the new numbers and any changes that we've seen over the last 12 months. Thank you. Marco, you're next. Thanks. Th uh, thank you, Leader. Um, what a comment and to a question. Um, you quite rightly pointed out that our uh, housing will be able to deal with people who have needs which most of the HRAs don't accommodate. And I'm a landlord and I have been for 50 years. And when we start talking to people who have special needs and they really do need help, you're not going to get away with the 2% void. But, you know, that's for something for you to look at and look at very carefully. And the, uh, the other question I was going to ask you was, um, you are clearly um, up to speed with what's going on. You do know that the um, energy requirements for properties are going to change dramatically by 2030. So if you're buying stuff, I'm assuming that you'll have somebody in there to check them all out because it's about £15,000 a property to bring them up to standard. So, you know, um, just make sure in case if you hadn't, if you didn't know, you don't know now, but just make, them get, 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 make sure they're checked out. If you're buying old, if you're buying new, you'll obviously build up to standard, won't you? Up to future standards. Thank you. <coughs> yes, Councillor. Um, in terms of building, we will absolutely build to uh, the, the required standards and uh, often um, you see local authorities go beyond that. So you know, again, we will cost all options out. Um, you know, we will bring forward uh, plans and proposals for passive house type technology, um, but that all then depends on the finances. So there, there has to be a trade off between how much it's gonna cost and, and the rental income that we can get back. But the reality is, is that we will uh, meet minimum standards, if not go beyond that. On acquisitions, there's two different types of acquisitions. One is where we'll be acquiring off plan. So we'll be working with developers and we can buy brand new properties being built. So they'll be built to the standard that we would expect. But you're absolutely right. If, if we're buying street properties, um, then the amount that we will need to invest in those will be quite significant. And we do need to take that into account. Mm -hmm. And that has been taken into account in all the modelling that we're doing. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Were there any other questions for Michael, Steve or Steve on this particular item? I don't see any. So if we could move to the uh, recommendations then. Um, but before I do, I just, I just want to say, Michael, you've done a great job, uh, Steve and Councillor Allen, in bringing all this together. And I will be slightly more political or more direct in that it is this Conservative administration that's taking seriously its responsibilities to those in need of social housing. And it is this administration that is pushing that through. And I want to be clear about that because, as Steve alluded to, others might make representations or try to take credit for this. But our ambitions are realistic uh, in the 1,200 that you have listed, not the 5,000 that perhaps others might tout as being um, actually deliverable. I want to be perfectly clear about that. This is a public forum, and it is this 
administration that is enabling this and taking this forward. So if I may move to the recommendations, they are set out uh, for you on page 19 of agenda item number five today in the Cabinet uh, through to one to six. Uh, I, take, I, I can suggest we take them on block uh, as agreed unless anybody has got any objection to that. I see none. So therefore those uh, recommendations today are, are approved by Cabinet and thank you very much for all your time and efforts into this item this morning. Thank you. We shall move on now to the next agenda item, which is item six, amendment to the arrangements with Empower, which you'll find on pages 81 to 90 today. Uh, Councillor Coles and Peter Carpenter will be speaking uh, to this, and no doubt there will be some questions from members. Uh, so Pete or oh, Andy, do you want to introduce? Thank you, Leader, yes. And um, members will excuse me if I go into some detail on this, because there has been some hyperbole um, in the press and I just thought I'd like to set the record straight and, and give a little bit of a story so we're very clear about what, what we're dealing with with the um, amendment to arrangements with Empower. The purpose of the report is to consider the report from Teneo Restructuring Limited advising on the options available to the Council following the notice of repayment sent to ECSP1 on the 30th of March 2021. Secondly, to approve the recommendation in that report to take control of the assets of ECSP1. So a little bit of history, um, in December 2014, the Council entered into a strategic partnership arrangement with Empower Community Management LLP to deliver solar panels on residential properties. As part of this arrangement and subsequent additions to the original scheme, the Council invested capital funds totaling £23 million, which resulted in over 7,700 rooftop installations which have been providing free electricity for the householders. The Empower loan is fully secured over the solar rooftop assets of ECS Peterborough 1 and was returning a commercial rate of return to the Council. This return contributed towards the budget position of the Council and helped to support the delivery of services. The original loan facility was contracted to terminate in October 2017, but within the original agreement, the Council was given the opportunity to extend the Mar to March 2019 to continue to fund existing and new projects. All new projects were completed by March 2018, and from that date, the facility has been extended by a series of Cabinet member decisions which are listed in the report. The last of which was in September 2020, giving authority for the construction loan facility to be amended to a long-term loan facility. Heads of terms for the new loan facility were signed in October 2020. The loan repay repayment profile within heads of terms agreed by both parties was underpinned by an aggressive financial model this was discussed by the Council, its advisers and Empower and assurances were given by Empower that this was achievable and realistic despite its aggressiveness in comparison to other market solar portfolios. On the 11th of March 2021, the Empower team informed the Council they were unable to make the full repayment of the last quarter's loan instalment as per the terms of the unsigned long-term loan agreement and requested the loan be reprofiled to accommodate this shortfall. The Empower team negotiated a bank overdraft. However, the proposed overdraft facility would have given the bank first security in precedence over the council's existing security, which was considered unacceptable by the council. The council sought advice from its advisors, Deloitte and Vincent Mason, and concluded in order to protect its interests, it was left in no option but to serve notice of repayment for the loan. The loan agreement with ECPS1 provided for this action in the event of a default on the loan. Advice was also taken on the repayment notice period for the loan. The Council decided that, as this was at its own discretion, a period of six weeks was appropriate. This was proposed to give recognition to the existing relationship with Empower and also to give a reasonable period of time for Empower to secure an alternative long-term funder. The six-week period expired and the Council's loan was not repaid. Insolvency Advisors Tenure Restructuring Limited, previously Deloitte LLP Restructuring Team, were jointly appointed by the Council and ECSP1 to assess the options available to the Council and ECSP1 to maximise value for creditors, including consideration of key risks, 
uncertainties and issues which would need to be addressed and identify the option which is likely to result in the maximum recoveries for creditors. Tenure Restructuring Limited have provided their advice and a summary of the options considered and the impact of those options you will see in the report attached to Appendix 1. Having considered the options, it's recommended that Cabinet approve the option to take control of the assets of ECSB 1. This will give the Council a higher degree of control of the portfolio both to, both to preserve the value of its investment and to be able to take advantage of future benefits that may arise as technologies and the electricity distribution network evolve over the next 15 years. The Council will appoint an interim asset manager in the short term, which will allow time to carry out a competitive tender exercise for a permanent asset manager. The Empower management team will be able to submit a tender in that process if they wish. The Council's external auditors and Xiong, as part of their review of the 2019-2020 financial statements, requested further audit evidence on the loan and the Council's security over the underlying assets. This work was finalised in March 2021 and Ernst Young informed the Council they were not minded to challenge the accounting treatment in the 2019-2020 financial statements, although note was to be made of the aggressive nature of the proposed model. This was received on the 10th of March 2021. Empower advised the Council that they were unable to pay the first year loan instalment in full on the 11th of March 2021. And this, together with their request to reschedule the agreed loan repayment schedule, was considered by the Council's advisers and auditors. The auditors Ernst Young requested a revaluation of the loan, considering the new information, in order that a post-balance event is noted in the 2019-20 financial statements. This revaluation has resulted in an impairment of the loan in the accounts to 20.4 million. The financial statements for 2019-20 are to be recommended for approval at the Audit Committee on the 21st of June 2021. During the life of the loan, the Council has received 5.8 million interest from ECSB1, which has cost 1.4 million for the Council to borrow, resulting in a net interest income of 4.4 million pounds. The Council has incurred financial and legal advice costs during the refinancing process, which has been funded from this net interest income. During the refinance process, the Council and ECSP1 have had to continue to comply with the short-term loan conditions. This means that interest has been charged at a much higher rate of interest and no loan repayments made. The loan to Empower ECSP1 falls within the definition of capital expenditure for accounting purposes and therefore forms part of the Council's capital financing requirement, the CFR. The 2.6 million write-down of the asset would be matched by an adjustment to the capital adjustment account with no direct revenue impact for 2019 and 20. Instead, as this adjustment was made in the 2020-2021 financial year, post-balance sheet event, the Council will implement a phased write-down of the potential loss in accordance with its minimum revenue position policy as contained in the medium-term financial strategy. This equates to an average yearly MRP charge of £176,000, which will begin in 2021-2022. So there are a series of recommendations which are to approve the recommendation from tenure restructuring to take control of the assets, to delegate authority to the Corporate Director Resources and Director of Law and Governance to agree the financial and legal arrangements necessary, and to approve the write-off of the outstanding invoices raised on ECSP1 using the additional provisions set aside for this purpose. Thank you, Leader. That's my uh, briefing on this particular item, and if there are any um, further information you require or questions, then Pete Carpenter is here to, to answer them. Thank you, Leader. Okay. Oh, hang on. Oh, a flurry of hands. Um, I think, uh, Irene, why don't you kick us off this morning? Thank, thank you very much, Leader. Um, yeah, could I just ask about the option of us taking the assets in-house? And I think I heard the word asset manager. Are we confident that we'll be able to find a competent body to manage them in view of the fact that what we thought was a competent body turned out to be um, rather difficult for us? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, we will look to run a tender process 
for asset managers. There are a number on the market. Uh, this, as we take the assets back, is looking to make sure we get the best value out of those assets in terms of managing them. Now, it could be empower other people we appoint in the end. But there are others in the market as well which we could look at. Thank you. Ray Bisbee. Thank you, Leader. Uh, in the first recommendation, it's to approve the recommendations from the insolvency advisor. I just wonder, were local firms approached to act as potential insolvency advisors? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, uh, we, were, we did approach uh, local firms and had uh, conversations with two local firms. However, due to the specialist nature of the solar portfolio uh, and the specialist knowledge required to enable a full options appraisal to be analysed, uh, they both recommended we went with the Deloitte restructuring team who had more expertise in the renewables areas. Thank you very much. Marco, you were next. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, Peter, I, I fully support the proposals, and as you very well know, we've had a number of conversations about this, perhaps over the last six months, if not 12 months, uh, and uh, you and I uh, thought that this is where it was going to end up. Uh, I see it as a very, very positive thing and a real opportunity for the council. Uh, it fits, in my opinion, within our um, uh, environment uh, ambitions. And one of the things that I see as a tremendous opportunity would be, I've done a quick you know, calculation. If the average home, if we've got 7,700 homes, all with solar panels, and the average home has got about two and a half kilowatts of producing two and a half kilowatts of energy it might be three it might be three and a half depends on how big the home is but let's say two and a half we've potentially got 20 megawatts of power now i believe under the new rules we may be able to actually claim that as part of our energy production the same way as we claim energy production from our power station uh, renewable energy power station so, you know, I would urge uh, you and the team or whoever uh, is working with you to actually look at the possibility of taking that 20 megawatts as, call it Peterborough energy production, and you could actually resell it. I'm not sure whether we've still got a, a list of customers that are buying cheap energy via the scheme that was set up some years ago, but you've probably got uh, a huge number of local residents who are already buying power through through the power scheme that the council has got, and it may be a way for you to increase the revenue from this particular opportunity greatly, to say the least. Peter. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor. Uh, a couple of points, uh, and I agree with you that there are opportunities here. However, because this was one of the original feed-in tariff contracts, at the moment, any benefit of the initial installations is offset by the feed-in tariffs that we get to the income stream. However, as we go, as depending on how the portfolio goes forward, any additional energy that's generated, as long as we can log what it is, can be sold into the grid, and it is it is green power. Uh, the limiting factor there is we do need meters on each of the uh, units, uh, but the government's uh, present timetable is to have every household with an electricity meter by 2025 and so that is available in the short term and anything over and above there from what we've got in terms of a feed-in uh, analysis we can take benefit of and that's one of the things we will look at because obviously uh, we've gone through this process over the last two to three years of uh, asking for the loan to be repaid and then looking for external people. But in that time, we've had the climate emergency and green power has emerged. And you know there is uh, a benefit of us having this in-house in terms of potentially those knock-on effects in the future. However, that needs to be offset against the maintenance of the whole portfolio and everything else. But yes, I agree, that is something we will be looking at. And it's something Empower were looking at, to be fair, to begin with, but weren't able to progress it to the level yet. Thank you. John Howard. Thank you, Leader. Um, can I ask, why did the Council not take a tougher stance on collecting the loan when opposition members 
were warning the administration of, of the risks that could be involved in that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, a little bit like the outturn position and the Council's financial position, you have to follow a process. And as part of that process, initially, uh, we called uh, ESP uh, one in at the end of Mar in March 2018. And there was up to a year for them to refinance the loan. Uh, they, and that time they were actively looking, but they uh, couldn't come up with a solution which uh, would deliver the value for us in terms of us getting all 23 million pounds back. It would have been a mix of debt and equity, and obviously we would not be first charge on the equity. Therefore, in February 20, uh, sorry, February 2019, we ran a tender process uh, with the help of Deloitte and Pinsons uh, and Empower to see if there are other viable options out there in the market. We did have one that came in at the, uh, potentially at the full amount, uh, another one which was about two million below. We did an ex exclusive deal with the one who were at the right amount, uh, and that went on for 10 or 11 months because there is significant due diligence with 7,700 roof-mounted units. In the end, that broke down just as COVID was starting, and so that took us to the third option, which was actually to convert the short-term loan into a long-term loan with Empower delivering it, and so that was where we got into the final model, again, with the help of our consultants, uh, and that was signed off by Cabinet toward, I think, September last year in terms of that, and we were looking to ratify that at the present time. I mean, I'll be fair to Empower at the moment. Empower have never missed a payment up to this point. But unfortunately, in this type of portfolio, as soon as that happens, you've actually got to take that sort of notice. So, you know, in the past seven years, they haven't missed a payment. Thank you. Uh, Steve Allen, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I think one for Peter Carpenter, actually. Um, and really, from a consumer perspective, um, can you tell me how much, on average, householders who uh, uh, use the scheme benefit from the sol solar installations on their roofs? Is it to their advantage, and to what level? Uh, Councillor, thank you. And uh, following on from what uh, Councillor Sarrest's question earlier on, uh, we've got some estimates from Empower who think it would save the people in the social housing roughly about £200 a year on their energy bills, which equates up to about £1.5 million a year in terms of energy for people in social housing. Uh, thank you. Do I s have any more questions on this from members? I don't see any. Okay. So, uh, Pete, again, if I just summarise before we come to the recommendations, if I may. Um, again, a much publicised scheme, much criticised scheme uh, by opposition, even, quote, it's a disaster. Um, I don't view it as a disaster, and I don't think the Cabinet team uh, view it as a disaster. It seems to me that we've been trying to be fair to everybody, uh, including Empower, who we, who we partnered with, and also bearing in mind that, as you just said, uh, there are members of the public benefiting to £200 uh, off their electricity bills, uh, circa £1.5 million recurring year on year, which is a good thing uh, for, for those in fuel poverty on, and on low incomes. Uh, we've made significant sums in income in terms of the interest being charged to date on the loan. So we are or have not lost money on this scheme, as has been claimed. So I want to be clear about that again. This is not a disaster. We've not lost money. I think perhaps the time is now to reevaluate how we take it forward. And uh, there are a lot of people in this room that have got some interesting ideas on how we might maximize our investment or indeed perhaps sell it on to somebody else if we might want to do that in the future. So it's probably best that we take this course of action for now. Uh, and, and I will turn to the recommendations. Uh, which are, uh, Andy has already read out, but they're on page 81. There are three of them. And I would put that to Cat Oaks. Yes, Pete? Uh, thank you, Leader. Just, just to, just to re-emphasise on the numbers, uh, in overall terms, 
we are on the interest side up by four and a half million pounds. Yeah. Obviously, there's a little bit of consultancy cost to come out of that. And the impairment of the loan is 2.6 million, and we've got about 400k of debt that will need to be written off. However, it's not all apples and pears because the interest is revenue, the other bits are capital in nature. So, on revenue, we're up by around four million. On uh, capital, we're down by about three million in cash terms. So, it's not like for like because obviously the capital bit goes on for a number of years. So, we are up in cash terms if you look at it in that respect, although they are very different parts of the balance sheet and revenue accounts. Uh, for the benefit of public and everybody else, Council's finances are complex enough. The opposition don't even understand them, uh, with many not knowing the difference between capital and revenue. The bottom line is we haven't lost money on this. We have made money on this. It is not a disaster uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's, again, more sensible investment, but it's time to take a, a stock of it and work to the future and perhaps set out a new roadmap for this, and I think we're all content with that. Um, and again, thank you for all your work uh, you've done on this. So if we do move to the recommendations, they are on page 81 members, uh, 1, 2 and 3. Uh, so if I don't see any objection, I take it those are agreed. Agreed indeed, that's unanimous, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, again, stay in the hot seat, uh, both Andy and Pete, as we move on to um, uh, the next item, which is item seven, uh, budget monitoring return financial outturn. Uh, you'll, you'll find that on pages 91 to 140 in your cabinet papers this morning. Uh, Andy, are you introducing or are we going straight to Mr. Carpenter? I'm indeed leader, yes, thank you very much. Again, something of a, a, a long introduction, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll forgive me because after all, 2020, 2021 has really been an unprecedented year. This report sets out the Council's outturn position at item 7 in terms of its revenue and capital spending and is the first stage in the formal outturning, outturn reporting process that will then be seen at the next stage of this report, the draft accounts and draft governance report being all, all reported to the Audit Committee on the 12th of July. The final outturn position for 2020-2021, subject to finalisation of the statutory and statement of accounts, is a 3.975 million underspend on the Council's revenue budget, with 56.8 million spent during the year on the Council's capital programme. We all know that the Council has been operating in challenging financial circumstances. This financial context has developed over the years due to underfunding, exposure to greater levels of risk and low financial resilience, resulting from its low reserve balances. A structural deficit is inherent in the Council's funding envelope, with little recourse to alternative options. Since 2018, the Council has subjected its financial strategy and approach to financial st sustainability to rigorous external financial challenges, and since 2019 has implemented an enhanced series of expenditure controls. Immediate action to reduce the costs of its operations in the medium term was underway in January 2020. However, newly identified and current MTFS savings had to be impaired as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery. Due to COVID-19, the government responded by providing further specific and unring fence funding to local government, which has largely covered these additional pressures. The Council has received approximately 70 new grants, totalling about £170 million. Some of these grants have been passported directly to businesses, social care providers or individuals, while others have funded specific activities. This additional funding has required additional monitoring reports to be submitted to government on a regular basis and reported through this committee on a monthly basis. Whilst this has provided some financial stability in 2020-21, it is expected there will be a longer-term service impact from COVID-19, for which longer-term funding is unconfirmed. Due to the Council's underlying financial challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic has introduced an additional layer of financial complexity and uncertainty. National Government decisions, funding and changes to legislation have been announced fluidly throughout the year with a further two national lockdowns announced at short notice. 
The, um, this unpredictability as a result of COVID-19 has made financial and operational planning and forecasting problematic. As a result of the challenges placed on the Council's finances, in October 2020, the Council approached the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, MHCLG, to enable the further exploration of alternatives to issuing a Section 114 notice and has received conditional approval for capitalisation directions, or well, that's borrowing, of up to £4.8 million in 2020 21 and up to £20 million in 2021 22. However, the, the 4.8 million amount allowed for in 2020 2021 will now not be required. This conditional exceptional support enabled the Council to set a legal balanced budget for 2021 and 2022. The Council continues to work closely with MHCLG to develop a delivery model to secure financial sustainability and provide assurance to satisfy the conditions attached to the exceptional support. Without the receipt of the exceptional support, the Council would not have been able to set a balanced and legal budget in 2021-2022. I'll just go into the current COVID position. Section 5 of the report sets out in detail the impact of COVID-19 on Council services and finances. I'll not go through everything here now. We as a Council have risen to the challenge and continue to support our communities and businesses in a number of ways, which have included supporting residents and businesses through three periods of national lockdown. Working collaboratively with the NHS to avoid hospital admissions where appropriate. The establishment of a coordination hub to provide residents that were vulnerable of shielding access to food, medicine and other essential support. The provision of accommodation to rough sleepers to ensure they could safely self-isolate. Carrying out proactive and intervention activities to minimise the spread of the virus and to ensure containment of the outbreak. Administering over £90 million of grants to businesses putting in place processes and support to ensure our staff can work ag agilely at home and elsewhere. Overall, we have £30.3 million of additional cost in 2020-21, which has been covered by £32.3 million of additional government grant. The significant places where council finance have been affected have included £11.7 million of additional costs to deliver adult social care services differently during the pandemic. Two million pounds of additional costs to provide accommodation to rough sleepers. 5.6 million of existing MTFS savings plans, which we've not been able to deliver. 5.8 million reduction of income collected, including 2.2 million pounds of parking income. In addition to this, business rates collections are lower by 11.5 million as a reflection, despite grants to some sectors, of businesses not being able to make these payments. So if we look at the final outturn position in Table 2, Section 6 sets out the overall revenue outturn position by department. Appendix A sets out the detailed outturn position with associated narrative for the different service departments. The final outturn position outlines a 5.5 million overspend on the Council Service Directorate budgets with the most notable overspend of 9.4 million reported for the People and Communities Directorate. The service area is most affected by COVID-19 pressures and additional activities such as with adults and children's social care, parking income and leisure services. This overspend has been offset by the unringfenced COVID-19 additional funding received from government, which has led to an overall 19.1 million underspend. Following a detailed review of this position, it's concluded that the presentation of the COVID-19 forecast pressures arising from the needs of our communities have been delayed, but will continue into 2021, 22 and future years. The Council incorporated some demand and cost increase assumptions into the future year's budget estimates. However, at the time of budget setting, due to the level of uncertainty as to how COVID-19 would really impact on the demand for council services, it proved difficult to develop meaningful assumptions on which to base income receipt levels and demand-led expenditure budgets. The council now forecasts an additional net cost of 12.8 million in 2021-2022. As outlined in Table 2, 
the Council has made a contribution to a specific COVID-19 funding reserve to ensure these additional pressures in 2021-22 are funded, bringing the final outturn position to an underspend of £3.975 million. This position included asset sales exceeding targets by £2.4 million due to the capital receipts for POSH and the mill, as well as reduced debt costs due to the reduced capital programme. The Council already had enhanced financial control in place, and these were enhanced in 2020-2021 to ensure the additional COVID-19 requirements were properly controlled. We are really concerned around the latent social care demand which is building up in adults, children and education. This is why we have set up the 12.8 million COVID-19 funding reserve to cover these projected pressures. A separate report on this agenda sets out the position on MPOWER, which has led to an impairment of the value of the loan. However, now we have an agreed position with our auditors and that we have taken a decision at this meeting today. This will allow the 2019-20 accounts to be finally closed on the 21st of June. Looking at our reserves, on the face of it, the reserves position looks rosy, with the position as at the 31st of March 2021 showing our year-on-year -year position increasing just under £34 million to £66.1 million. However, this is misleading. The diagram set out in Section 7.4 sets out that of this £66.1 million total, £15.1 million is ring-fenced ring to COVID-19 latent demand, as I previously described. £20.2 million is government grant in advance for rates rebates being granted in 2021-22. 4.3 million are ring-fenced reserves and can only be used for very specific purposes. 6.3 million are departmental reserves which are generally linked to specific grants and so they're also ring-fenced. And 6 million pounds is the general fund balance which is a bare minimum. This leaves just 14.1 million pounds of reserves to cover transformational investment, unforeseen incidents, budgetary overspends and any other significant incidents and you'll see more detail set out in Appendix B. Moving to the capital outturn. On the capital side, the Council's Treasury activity during 2020-21 has been compliant with the Treasury Management Strategy improved in March 2020 as part of the MTFS process. This information complements the Prudential Indicators Performance Report, which you'll see at Appendix C. The Council's final revised capit capital budget was 83 million pounds, which includes the budget for the Investor Save schemes of 13.47 million for the 2020-21 financial year. Capital budgets as agreed for the 2020-2021 MTFS were 146.4 million. This budget contains slippage from 2019-20 to the tune of 12.24 million pounds. The budget as reported at 31st of January 2021 was 83 million. The final expenditure for each director to set out in section 9.3 of the report which amounts to £56.76 million. The table also sets out how that expenditure was financed. Major projects included in this expenditure included £15 million on the new Manor Drive and Hampton Lake Schools, as well as the expansion of Marshfield, £21 million on highways, £4 million on the new library and culture hub, which we'll, we'll be calling The Vine. £3 million on the Fletton Keys Hotel short-term loan and £2 million on the purchase of 88 Lincoln Road as next steps accommodation. Overall, the Council debt levels have slightly reduced over the year by £8 million to £470 million. Over 70% of the Council's loan portfolio has an expiry date of over 10 years. We have two secured loans, one to Empower, which is subject to an additional report on the agenda, and one to the Fletton Keys Hotel, which is payable in 2022-2023. So in summary, Appendix D sets out the key financial performance, which includes 86.2% of payments being made within 30 days. That's a 5.4% increase on last year. 99.6% of payments are being made electronically. Incredibly, only 268 cheque payments were made in the year, which is an extraordinary change. Overall, sundry debt reducing by £5.3 million year-on-year year to £21.8 million. 
Housing benefit overpayments were slightly below last year. Council tax collection is slightly lower than last year at 0.65%. National non-domestic rates collections are significantly lower, as mentioned earlier in the report, 16.06% less than last year. Reviews are in process to ensure this backlog is collected. And also the Appendix D sets up the £90 million of additional grants that have been administered during 2020 21 Leader, it's recommended that Cabinet note this report. Thank you, Andy. Um, comprehensive. And some remarkable numbers in there, uh, if you uh, bear in mind that we've been through, uh, or still in our a national pandemic. So no wonder some of the figures have been affected, particularly NNDR, etc. But I, I think uh, overall a very positive um, start. We could be in a better position, I agree. Um, I'll just look for questions. So Ray and then Irene, uh, we could kick off with those, please. Thank you, Leader. <coughs> um, in, in terms of outstanding debt, there's been some reduction, which is grateful. But can this be improved on even more? Uh, for you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Councillor. You can always do better on debt. You need to chase it proactively up front. The perfect situation for debt is everyone does prepayments. Then we don't have any debt to collect because it's all been paid. However, we are in the middle of a set of negotiations with the uh, CCG, the critical care group. Uh, that is over 60% of our debt. Uh, with an agreement there for the people coming out of hospital, we will have a firm platform going forward where everything is agreed. I think there's another meeting tomorrow to try and finalise that. Uh, we will also have internal audit at the moment carrying out an audit on the end-to-end -end process to make sure if there are any improvements that can be made in the process that they are done and this will look at the end-to-end -end process and probably focus a lot on how debt is raised and is debt always valid and at the other end when debt has been raised we go through the normal automatic process is actually when you get to the write-off stage or refer to legal that actually everything is quick at that stage. Councillor Walsh. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I'd just like to make a comment before I ask a question. And I think I'd like to say that I can only applaud this council's response to the huge challenges that have been faced as a result of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the support to local businesses, uh, local people, particularly the vulnerable, and I followed this closely in my previous cabinet portfolio area. Um, so I'd just like to say congratulations on a very difficult job that was carried out and is continuing to be carried out um, my question is really about the variances. Um, what can we learn from the variances in the forecast outturn during the year? Interesting question. Uh, I think most directors of finance will say this has been an unprecedented year in terms of what councils have had to deal with operationally and how the government has funded it. Uh, the government have been extremely proactive in getting funding out to us. Sometimes we have funding before we quite understand what we can spend it on, which is sometimes followed by two to three weeks. But it's been really good that the money has got out to people quickly. However, that has brought in difficulties in terms of logging things and making sure that processes are in place and that funding is used for the right things when one or two grants could be used for similar things. And so I think because we had processes in place uh, due to the financial reviews and other uh, reviews we'd done in 1920, we had a basis for checking on everything. However, I think as a council, we've been quite prudent in what we forecast to government. We've been reporting to government on a monthly basis. Uh, and I think, like a lot of other councils, the effect of latent demand has caught a lot of councils, I won't say out, but has caught councils in a dilemma of when it's going to happen. 
And so, you know, the 13 million reserve is probably the bit you'd point to to say, would you have known about that earlier? Well, it's difficult. It's a bit chicken and egg because when is it actually going to happen? Do you need lockdown to have finished for some of it to happen or don't you? And so in some places it has been okay, in other places it hasn't. So I think that's the biggest learning point. Also, the difficulty of administering 70 different grants for things. You know, it's, it's a lot of additional work has gone in this year. I mean, as Council Cole set out, we've had significant additional money uh, this year, uh, almost two thirds as much as our net budget to administer either to third parties or to help run our services. And that has made it difficult but challenging, but invigorating to make sure that our communities have been actually delivered to. Thank you. Marco, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, good report. If you've got the guts to read it all word for word, it's really interesting. It shows you guys have done a tremendous job. Um, I mean, I'm not going to ask you a question on the report. I want your gut feeling about what's COVID done to us and what is it that we might expect to come down the road uh, in the next year or two. Uh, interesting. In, in terms of COVID, as last year, we've had around 30 million to support our services from indirect grant. In this financial year, the government assumptions we're working on at the moment are that they will fund this difference for the first quarter of the year, which amounts to about nine million pounds. After that, the grant, so that's what we've got grant funding for this year and that drops out next year. And so I think the conundrum for all councils at the moment is, and if you look at just about every council in the country's assessment of future years because of the pent up latent demand uh, for our services, some of them which have been delayed, we've had people keeping kids at home, all sorts of things, uh, is that this isn't just going to drop off this year. It's going to go for another couple of years. And so there's significant discussions going on at the moment with MHCLG. You know, they've taken the, the step on the finance side of having almost weekly meetings with some directors of finance, but round tables, at least on a monthly basis, to ensure that they understand where council service delivery you think they are. And I think the key is gonna be when lockdown finishes, how things work in that next three months in terms of delivery, because that's when we will probably see the, I won't, I'll use avalanche and it could be that sort of magnitude of people asking and needing to deliver to our services. The other big issue is gonna be when furlough ends. Uh, that's gonna potentially affect uh, Michael services in terms of housing particularly, uh, uh, housing benefit, but also people using our services because we will tend to see people increase of using our services when they become unemployed. So there's a lot of massive key indicators that are gonna hit, hit us over the next six months. And I think in some cases, the government is looking at it as well saying, well, we're not sure either. And again, going back to report on what Councillor Cole said earlier, this has been unprecedented, you know, it's not even a once in a generation, it's a once in a lifetime at the moment. And as we move through recovery into the next stages, it's gonna be really important that we understand where we are. This is the reason why the government continue to want us to report on a monthly basis, MHCLG. Now, we only ever report to MHCLG once a year. Well, we used to tell them the budget and the outturn. At the moment now, we give them great detail on a monthly basis because that's how involved they are compared to where they were 18 months ago. Thank you. Did, did I have anybody else wanted to ask a question on this? No, stunned into silence, Peter, as usual. Thank you. Um, so in summary then, I'd just like to say that the finances of the city are key to our success. And we have a great team in place managing our finances and what are difficult circumstances which have been well publicized and we look forward to any inspection from any quarter uh, and we will stand our ground about how well we are managed and i believe that uh, with our finance team and our decisions that we make as a administration i can hand on heart say that uh, as again uh, you'll find that it's my first public cabinet meeting 
which will have a slightly different edge to it that I will keep telling everybody we are Conservatives that are running this city. And as Conservatives, we want to see economic growth in our city at a faster pace. And we've done pretty well so far. Uh, that means more job creation. It also means more education opportunities and better opportunities, including the university, which, uh, again, if people want to take a walk around the city, you'll see that that is going up pretty quickly now. Uh, we've already discussed uh, homes today and the establishment of a, an HRA, but I also want to see more and encourage more private sector development, both in terms of uh, quality housing, uh, and people should aspire to home ownership, but for those that perhaps don't want to do that, our HRA will be of some assistance to those that will uh, t take the choice not to. Uh, and also, and uh, it's very dear to most uh, people in the room, uh, our leisure and culture opportunities uh, that we're looking to develop in the city, because you'll have heard me say that Peterborough is on the up, uh, and we definitely are. So I want to make that clear because it's relevant to our financial position and, and how we manage the council going forward. Um, so sermon over. I'd like to turn to the recommendations as they are uh, today on page 91, uh, one to six, uh, and I'll take those all as agreed unless I have any show of hands that says otherwise. No, good, thank you very much. So that item is agreed. Um, so we shall now turn to the final item, I, I think it is for today, which is the outcome of petitions uh, on pages 141 to 144. These are just for noting, uh, so unless anybody's got any specific comment, we can take those as noted. I would just also like to say as a final comment, because some people watch this back, uh, Councillor Coles went through lengthy uh, discussion quoting figures and pages and reports. I would remind people that those reports can be found online on the Council's website. So for those watching it back, if anybody wants to check the paperwork in terms of the detail Councillor Coles was referring to, or indeed Mr Carpenter, it is all public information and it is online. But I would also welcome questions at any time to me and members of the team uh, through the new Ask the Leader uh, um, doorway, shall we say, that you can get to myself and cabinet members directly uh, with anything that you want to ask a question about that we've made a decision on or that we might be thinking of doing. It's a good way to keep in touch with members of the public. So other than that, I think basically we are done for today. Uh, and I would thank you all for your time and we will resume again at the next cabinet meeting. Uh, I don't know the date, but it will be publicised on the Council's website and members of the public are welcome to join in online or indeed here in person.